Welcome all. It is four o'clock and we are starting our panel discussion on open source software um, in the geosciences, the full name, yes. Um, as many of you might know, this is kind of a new format and it is, these people will not be giving talks. We're gonna be having an open discussion. Uh, the panel has put together some questions that we feel are relevant um, to the discussion. We'll try and kind of stay on those. We, have, we encourage audience uh, participation. We have two microphones set up. If you have a question, stand at the microphone and um, don't wait until we're on another topic. Let's keep going on these topics. And if a topic is not as interesting, we'll move on to another one. Um, our goal here is to have an informative, engaged, and insightful discussion on open source software. Um, my name is uh, Lou Pellerin. Um, I'm, I'm one of the conveners. Um, I'm interested, I was a coder for about 10 years, and um, now I'm more interested on the user side of things. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's my interest in open source. Our other co-convener. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Kelbert. I'm with the US Geological Survey um, Geomagnetism Program. And I've been involved in software development for as long as I'm involved in the geosciences. Um, I'm also very interested in um, making data more accessible. Um, and uh, my primary interest in all of this is um, or rather stems from um, my belief that science should be reproducible um, and uh, my other belief that uh, we should not be all inventing the same will. Uh, we should be building up on other people's achievements. So I'm looking forward to the session. And we're giving each of our panelists two minutes to introduce themselves and say a few words about their code. Um, Oh, and, and before we move on, sorry, um, I just want to give um, Lindsay, um, Heggie, and Luz um, were two strong motivators behind this. And in retrospect, I think that uh, Lindsay and Anna should have probably been on the panel <laughs> next year. Okay. Um, and as, as you can see, the other co-conveners co that uh, helped put a lot of thought into how to do this. Next slide. Oh, and our panelists. Here's our panelists, and the next slide. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're still trying to get smooth on this. So we thought we would, one of the questions we had was, what is open source? And we decided to use the definition from opensource.com. So this is going to be kind of where we're starting from. There can be a lot of definitions, um, but this is, we're, we're, we're using this for the uh, purposes of the panel discussion. By the way, this is being live streamed and it will be on YouTube um, sometime later too. Anyway, so next slide. Gary. Two minutes. Well, well I'm, I'm one of the older people here, so I've done a, a, a several things. But I, I think the main thing, uh, the first thing that I did, which was uh, I released some uh, data processing code for Magneto to Lurks, which is now fairly widely used. Um, and, and then I've worked on inversion, uh, both with students and with, uh, with Anna, in fact, uh, and uh, have released 2D and 3D uh, inverse codes for Magneto to Lurks. And uh, they're freely available, and we give out the source code. I'm not sure whether they qualify completely as, sor as open source in, in the sense that people really modify them and, and, and actually do change them a lot. But, but there, we give out the source code and people could. Okay. Kerry? Uh, yeah, I'm Kerry Key from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And um, I've written a couple uh, modeling codes for uh, electromagnetics, uh, parallel 
um, adaptive finite element code called Mari 2DM and then a 1D code called Dipo 1D. These are both um, open source in the sense that the code's freely available. It's licensed under the GNU, uh, GNU GPL version 3.0. Uh, so you can use the code and modify it as you and redistribute it as you please, um, and you know I, I, I will say you know I actually am a benefit of, uh, of I benefited from Gary uh, releasing his codes because when I was a student I got his code and could use it and modify it for uh, my own needs. You're welcome. Next is Leon. Um, hi, uh, my name is Leon Grischer. I'm currently a postdoc at the ETH in Zurich. Um, I'm a small seismologist by training, and I mainly work on large-scale seismic inverse problems and machine learning. Um, a couple of software projects I've been involved with, like the first one is OpSpy. I got involved during this with this during my undergrad, and we've been developing it for like, let's say, eight years by now. And this is truly an open source community project, and we've had, honestly, 70 direct code con contributors over the last couple of years. Um, next thing is Salvos, which is a C++ code for full wave for modeling and inversion two and three dimensions for various wave physics. And a couple of other projects, one is like for a large scale seismic inverse, um, large scale seismic inversion framework, presents deals with the data management side of, um, for waveform inversions. And the last one at the very bottom is called, so I'm kind of also interested in how to exchange data with others, and that's like an HD5 based container format for seismology, which essentially manages to, uh, or enables people to build full data sets and exchange them, including full provenance information, so you can keep track of the full processing information. And all the things are open source. Um, some, are, some of them are only me, but others are shared with um, code developed with lots of other people. Next. Next. Hi, I'm Brian Savage. I'm from the University of Rhode Island, a faculty member there. Um, the code that I work on is uh, SAC. Uh, any seismologist, I think, knows what SAC is, or at least a global seismologist knows what SAC is. It's the seismic analysis code. Uh, it was originally written in the 80s um, in Fortran, and, uh, and it was open for most of the, for the 80s and then up until about 1994, uh, at which it point that it was only released as binary, and then it kind of shut down as the, the national lab stopped supporting the development of the code. And then uh, in about 2004, the uh, IRIS organization, or the Incorporated Research Institute in Seismology, um, licensed the code from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab and uh, allowed it to be, uh, let's say, quote unquote, open sourced. It's not technically open sourced uh, under the open source license um, because there are export restrictions on it, and so we can't give it to, say, Iran or Yemen. Um, and I'm, I'm completely serious about that. Uh, it is. It does uh, digital signal processing. It has uh, fur filters and infinite info, impulse response filters. It does convolution correlation, uh, instrument response, basically all the digital signal processing that's required for seismology. Um, and it's actually currently written in C, and it's not going to change because I'm not going to rewrite it. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Leo is next, I think. Leo? Hi, I'm Leo Uyeda. I'm a assistant professor at the State University of Rio, but I'm currently on leave at the University of Hawaii, and I'm working there on the Python wrapper for GMT. Um, I also develop two other software packages. One is Tesseroids, which is a C command line programs that do forward modeling for gravity on the sphere. And I also develop Faciono Terra, which is a Python library for modeling and inversion. Uh, it does mostly gravity and magnetics. There are a few seismic things in there, but since it's not my, my main field of study, then it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Um, that last one has had a few external contributors, but most of the code there is still maintained by me. So, but if anyone wants to join, they're more than welcome. And we had a, a sixth uh, panelist, Colin Zelt from Rice University, uh, who was not able to make it. Um, so we have five panelists. OK, so um, these are the questions that we posed to the panel. And we had them think about it. And that little matrix there of color coding, um, one, which is yellow, means that they were very interested or I'm sorry, red. <laughs> uh, red means they're very interested, and that's a one, and the gray was a six, meaning not so interested. 
Um, and there's going to be, we'll, we'll go through each of those questions, and there's going to be a little bar at the bottom with that color coding and, and which of the members of the panel are interested in, more interested in, in that topic. And so we'll kind of cycle through there. And we'll have each of the questions up as we discuss them. And again, we'll stay on a subject as long as there's interest. So, um, next slide. Oh, and, and so, just so that you know, um, questions are welcome anytime, and also comments, um, if there is anything you have to add to the topic, please also stand up and, and uh, speak up. Right, don't wait until we're done. This is a discussion, right? Okay. So, looking at the little color bar on the bottom, it looks like Carrie's most interested in this me. one. <laughs> Okay, so, um, Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I've made some electromagnetic software that's uh, freely available. I think one of the primary decisions for me making my software openly available was when I was a student. Um, so I do electromagnetics and I do seafloor electromagnetics. And not only is it a small field, it's a really small field. And um, there's been, there was, when I was a student, there was electromagnetic software that was available. Um, some of it, um, well, much of the software wouldn't actually work on the seafloor, so I couldn't just go out and you know use somebody else's code that would, that uh, some of the few codes that were freely available at the time. And then um, there are some applications for um, the industrial use of EM uh, in the oceans, so doing seafloor EM mapping. And there was commercial software available, and I didn't want to buy commercial software because I wanted to get into the software and modify it for my own needs. And so when I started to develop my own software, um, it made sense to make it um, open source and freely available, but simply because there was no other software out there. And, and I, I wanted to see my um, you know, small community of um, researchers doing the same thing as me. I wanted to see that community grow. And so by making the software freely available, other people could run model studies, um, do the sorts of, you know, same sorts of things that we're doing, and then even get the codes and improve them and do other things. And so it really was um, you know, a community growth and community outreach type effort to make it uh, freely available. And Leo, you were yeah. interested in this topic too, I think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I first came across open source when I was doing some undergrad research, and that was the first time that I saw Linux and Unix systems, and, and so I was very interested in that. I had no idea what it was about. I started reading about the GNU project, and it's very inspiring when you like see all the, the rants of Richard Stallman and the like, and it felt to me immediately like this is what science initially should be, like with uh, open sharing and collaborative and everything, uh, everyone being able to access every part of every other scientist. Um, so that, that was a very idealistic view and I started sharing things first and asking my advisor for permission later, which might not have been the best choice. Uh, but in the end, uh, I was very lucky because she was very, very cool with it, she was fine. Uh, didn't encourage me to pursue it as a career path, but I can understand that. Uh, but I ended up doing it anyway. And yeah, so thinking about what consequences will it have if you share your software is a little bit difficult because you can never tell. Sometimes you put it out there and no one sees it or it gets no views or no downloads or anything, but um, I think it's more important to think about that if you are publishing a paper and want to make the software that you wrote for that paper available. That's a more important place to start when you're thinking about it. Anyone in the audience have anything they want to say on this one or any of the other panel members? Okay, Gary. <laughs> I, I rated this. I rated this one a six, because when I heard the question, I thought, you know, I don't think I ever even thought about it. I just kind of, you know, just it seemed natural that you ought to make what you were doing available, and I, and and just list. Just it occurs to me now that there's actually a point, to, valuable point to be made. It was I did it because it was easy to do because there was a in the electromagnetic community, there was a place where you could just put software, and that was the MTNet 
Uh, and you know, and what, I didn't think about it. I just put it there because there was a place to put it. And I think that's probably probably one of the things that would make make it easier to do is to sort of have places where people would look for this kind of software. Uh, anyway, that, that's that was my take. I didn't. I, I said six because I don't think I even thought about it. Your age or something? I mean, a different age. I didn't mean your age, but it was yeah, a different I, age. <laughs> think about right. But, but having a place to put it was, I think, if there hadn't been, I wouldn't have. Uh, just a, might be a bit of a is it, is it might be a bit is of a cynical on? question. I'm not really sure. Um, Maybe uh, try the one in the front. Yeah. yeah. Tap it and see if it makes a noise. Yeah. yeah. So that's on. Uh, it might be a bit of a cynical question, but. Uh, is there, Leo kind of talk, uh, touched on it, where when you're submitting a paper, is it, I don't know, I've found in my experience when I submit a paper, if I submit my code with it, people might be a bit more likable to actually accepting it because it's like, oh, okay, you've submitted your code as well, so there might be more contributions. Do you find that it is better to submit just simply due to the fact that it's more likely a paper would be accepted, or are you submitting it as an open source just because you also want to, I guess? Oh. I think that's kind of getting into the question of how to fix your career. Um, a bit, more? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different answers. There. Yeah, there's a lot of different answers. Leo, did well, you want yeah, to just, just a quick comment on that. Um, uh, I don't think most people will actually look at the code, especially the reviewers. But myself, as when I review something, I always try to see if the person is sharing the code. And if they do, that does give bonus points um, for credibility because otherwise it might feel like they're try they have something to hide and if you just put it out there it's like, okay I, I have nothing to hide and if you find an error it's it's an honest mistake it's not something that you were deliberately trying to do uh, but yeah the hard thing is getting people to actually getting the reviewers to actually take the time and look at the code that that is hard because we have very little time to do the reviews. Um, yeah. I think I'd like to just add to that that um, you know there are a lot of communities not not as strong in the geosciences, at least from what I've seen, but there are other communities where releasing your code um, with your paper is part of you know the scientific reproducibility. I mean, not all of us, but many people get their data off the internet, and so if you get your data off the internet and you release the code that you use to analyze it, then anybody else could get that get your code get the data and they could reproduce your, your results you know, now or you know, years from now. And so I think there's a real value to um, releasing your code with a paper simply so that people can reproduce your results both to verify that you've done it correctly but also to learn how to learn the technique and learn, learn the methods you know, simply through emulating what, what's pub published. And I also think like recent kind of developments like Jupyter Notebooks and like kind of containerized services enable sharing your codes easier with others. So an example I have that we've like, I think beginning of this year, we published a paper and we have a cloud service that hosts Jupyter Notebooks and not the service. We essentially offer one kind of Jupyter Notebook that reproduces every single figure in the paper. People can just go to the website and actually look exactly at the code, just run it and see what happens. And I'm not sure it got us any more citations, but a lot of people actually said to me, hey, that's actually kind of cool. So long-term effort, I don't know what like long-term effect, I don't know what it's going to do, but and if more people would start doing this, I mean, I guess we all looked at papers and they yeah, have, I mean, the equations don't match the picture, like what's, what's happening. If more people would start like um, kind of sharing the source code they use for the papers, because most papers in the end are, at least in my field, a lot of those are actually computational papers, that will make a lot of things a lot easier. And also increase reproducibility long term. Yeah. Well, reproducibility, I mean, back in the day, a paper would have to have enough information in there that you could reproduce it. And then data sets got it larger and source code not being available. And we now have papers where we look at models. Yeah. Yeah. How do you evaluate that? Right. So I, I think just we like should move to on to the next question. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I just had one question. This, this question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Um, this question interests me because it presupposes something. And I kind of want to turn it on its head and ask you the question the other way around, which is it presupposes that all code by default is closed. Mm. And so you have to make a conscious choice to open it. Um, and my understanding is if we want to do good science, the question should probably end up being what considerations went into your decision to make your code closed. So I was wondering if you could 
comment on will we ever reach sort of that point where the question is not, yeah, why did you make it open, but why did you make it closed? And what factors will have to change, let's say, for the question also to change? Well, um, if you actually look at most journals, author instructions, they almost always have a section there saying that every single publication uh, needs to have enough information and data in order for the study to be reproduced. That is, so the, the policy is already in place, it's just never enforced. So I've never seen a paper get rejected because they didn't share the data. Well, I, I do think it's a good point, um, you know, to, to turn the question on its head. And, um, you know, I know, at least from my experience, um, making open source software freely available, so you, you end up uh, generating a lot of email inquiries from random people around the world that want help using your software. So, um, you know, there are times where I think, you know, this is a poorly written, this is a, a sloppily written piece of software. I'm not going to release it because if I do, I'm going to get a lot of emails from people asking how the hell do you use this. So, um, so that, that, that would be the cynical answer to your question. Yeah. Um, are, are there any journals, open journals right now that accept open software as a publication? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There are a couple. There's actually one, I forgot the name. Do you remember it? Uh, the no, Journal no. of Open Research Software. Exactly. Uh, JORS. Exactly. That's basically a journal where you write like a one-page abstract Test? and the DOI to your code. I know. That, wa that one is the, one? the oh, Journal of Open Source Software. Oh, man. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the success. As an associate editor on a, a journal, a Geophysical Journal International, I can tell you there was just a discussion about whether or not, you know, about how extreme the requirements should be about uh, insisting that people uh, include everything. And the conclusion of pretty much un not unanimous was that, that there should not be such a severe requirement. There are people who work in industry who publish in our literature who uh, d really don't have a choice. And uh, Speaking it, as one. <laughs> uh, hi, Carrie. Uh, we did attempt in Exxon to use the open source code. I want to just point out a stumbling block we came across that you used a subroutine from someone else called Triangle, which we were never able to get the rights to, so I could never install the code, yeah. even though you wanted us to do it, use it. So yeah. uh, companies, um, as a retired Exxon employee, I can't tell you anything more about the fact that uh, what I worked on then, I was there. And I'm one of those small group of people that did work on the seafloor right. mapping with electromagnetics. And it was great fun and very successful while it lasted. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I encourage open source. I think now that I'm retired, I have to figure out how to start up my own computing network. That's one reason I'm here. So yeah. nice. I encourage open source. I just want you to recognize that companies have a very proprietary approach to science and, and information transfer. And you need to be very careful that you release everything you can. Yeah. It took me 18 months to install a free version of XV, I think it was, back in the 80s. Things are a little better now. Yeah. Thank you. But I think also for research group, one, groups, one has to consider that like making a software is sometimes a considerable effort that can take, that can cost hundreds of millions of like dollars. So if you're like a group leader and you invest that money, you might want to keep your competitive advantage and like just keep the code for yourself. That's just. That's business. Yeah. That is business. But also, like many research groups are a bit, bit organized, like small yeah. startups, I think. Yep. So there's another angle to that as well. Yeah. OK. Oh. So um, I just wanted to respond to this question as to um, what considerations could ever go into the decision of not sharing your code. And um, I, I've been in the academic community all, all my life. And um, as a young scientist, I've been developing software that people have been using. Um, I've been devoting a lot of my effort to it and a lot of time. As a result, um, I've, been, I've been helping others use my software. I haven't had enough um, time uh, to actually use it myself and publish papers using my software. Um, as opposed to publishing papers um, on the, build, the development of my software, which, which um, apparently, as it turns out, um, those are the, the types of papers which are very hard to publish. Um, Take, it took me five, five years to get the paper through, even though people were using the software all over the place. Um, so uh, you end up in a situation when you're perhaps a young scientist, like myself in that time, um, um, spending a lot of effort on the software development, helping others answering questions on the software. Um, but then uh, um, 
the um, career advances um, do not consider um, those, those um, efforts as, as a major contribution. What's considered is um, publications. Um, but then somebody else has taken your software and, and using that software in publications while you are providing support. Um, so, so there are considerations that um, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not that I would advocate for not sharing software, um, uh, but I, and we, we'll, we'll get into this topic later, but um, I, I really do think that the reward system has to change to make it more accessible. I'd like to add, I, I, since the question has already been modified, I want to modify it again. Um, go back one second. <laughs> We're trying to move forward. Yeah, I know. I'm going to say that the software I work on, I had no decision in the matter of making it open source. Um, and so I'd like to say what considerations went into your decision to contribute to open source software. And for me, that's a, a, a giving back to the community and a kind of a selfish reason of making the software that I use better for me. Um, and so there were a number of different decisions in terms of why I decided to contribute and somehow got sucked into the uh, maintenance of this piece of software that I work on. So, Can I add also one very small comment? <laughs> like, no, no, small. just like a, a pro open source thing. Because if like most of us are somehow paid by tax dollars, at least in Europe that's the case, if you're paid by the state, your stuff, all you think do belongs to the public, so that's a very strong argument in my opinion to open your source code and kind of give it to everyone. Okay, well, I, I'm going to make a comment now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wrote down why closed, and I put a dollar sign there. And I, I think of it in terms of resources. Um, if, if the government's paying for it, I mean, one of the discussions we were having earlier is a lot of the open source stuff is done for free, right? There is no funding for it. And, and it, it does get down to, it's a resource thing, yeah. whether it's open or closed. But we're going to move on now. <laughs> the next question. That was the least interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How has making your software open source affected your career? We kind of got started on that. Um, <coughs> Gary, huh? Gary, you're the high roller here. Uh, it's benefited it. Um, I think. I mean, share a specific example. Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, going back. I mean, it depends upon what you release, probably, and what kinds of things you do. You could probably there's probably a lot of thankless tasks, but if you re, if you release something that a lot of people use, uh, you know, you get known for 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 that. I mean, a lot more than just having published the idea. Um, I mean, you get known and and people. Uh, cite your paper, you get a lot of citations. If you produce something that's useful, you know, and you make it available, uh, and I think, you know, it, I think it's benefited my career a lot. I've always made things available, and I've, uh, I'll, give, I'll give another specific example, not of myself, but of a student of mine who I uh, who encouraged to release his software, and, you know, as he was getting, packing up to leave, I said, you know, let's, let's spend a week and write a manual. I mean, you you make a draft, and I'll and I'll correct the English, and you know we you know, and I you know I, I think it helped his career immensely. I mean, because you know it w it was something that a lot of people found useful, and a lot of people around the world used it, and uh, I, so I I think it can be you know very useful in a long term sort of sense, even though there's a big investment, especially if you're going to really make it if you're going to make it useful, you have to provide some documentation and describe how to use it, some examples, some test, tests and things like this. And that's, that's a lot of extra work that you don't necessarily have to do to publish the paper. Um, and it, but, but, it, but that's what it takes to make it useful to other people. Yeah, so I guess I could add to that. Um, I certainly, um, you know, it did affect my career um, in the sense that I published a, a 1D modeling code a long time ago and it's my most highly cited paper. I mean, I barely use the code now, but apparently, it's widely used um, according to the citations on the paper. But also, um, you know, in, in releasing codes, I've noticed that, uh, I mean, what it's, it's helped my career because it's led to collaborations. Like, people will use my codes and they'll come to me with questions like, oh, I want to use your code to do this, but it can't quite get there. And so then, you know, I'll go, oh, well, I can change it and do this. And then all of a sudden, a collaboration struck up and then another paper is written. 
And so, um, you know, by putting your software out there, you're make, you're sort of, you know, putting up a sign that says, hey, I'm available, you know, I've got these codes, and like, you know, if, if it can't do what you want, well, maybe we can change it and make it do what you want, and then we'll write a paper. And so, there's definitely been uh, a few examples of that in my, my uh, career the last few years. Um, yeah, I guess most things have already been said. I mean, I think I come from a bit of a different angle that I guess my, I got started in like open source software development very early during my undergrad. So I basically my first like significant contribution to the community came from developing software. And I think it's arguably still by far my most important contribution. And also if you think about like what scientists kind of do, like a scientist to try to move your field just a tiny bit forward. And I guess kind of when you start developing software that lots of other people start to use, the um, cumulative um, kind of impact you have on your community is quite a bit bigger, depending if it's successful or not, than if you would do individual science. So this kind of multiplicative, multiplicative effect, if you have a couple hundred people using your code and it makes their science just a tiny bit faster, just a tiny bit better, you actually have a very big um, cumulative um, impact on the on science, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I want to add to the that two other leads, things that have already been said. Hmm? So it yeah, it leads right into, into uh, um, unless yeah. somebody uh, else wants to. Question. Oh. The first one. And uh, I, I would say that if you're doing methods research, so if you're developing new methods, uh, the software will be a lot more useful than just the theory in the paper. So no one is gonna, well, very few people are gonna read your paper and write a code to implement it and then use it and then cite it. So if you've already done the work of, well, you've already done the work of making the software, so if you put it out there, it's a lot more likely that someone is actually gonna use it but it's also consider considerably more effort, I think. Like just writing a prototype yeah, for yeah. a paper like, and then actually making a product out of it takes like 10 times the effort I want to say. Okay, questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. Anybody question, in the, oh. um, on that. So if you've developed a new code um, and the paper hasn't quite been published yet, but because you're, you're still in the process of your own analysis, how do you, I guess, get the word out, aside from, you know, the one-year conference, for, for people to know that it's there to use? Uh, uh, social media helps, and, but uh, if, if you can get it on, uh, on the conference, it always helps as well. Um, or maybe, like, email lists or something like that, but... Uh, just generic networking. Like, yeah. I mean, you have to be somehow connected to get, get people to know it is. But if you're talking about if you kind of have already, you don't, didn't publish the paper yet, but you have users, I mean, you can get DOIs for your software in any kind of stage it is right now. Mm. So you can start collecting citations if you want, even if you do not yet have a paper. Interesting. So that's a useful thing, I guess. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a critical development, I think. The, the, the attribution of data object identifiers to software directly and to data sets directly, so that people don't have to cite your paper um, with your analysis, instead of they cite the specific development that they're using, such as the software. And then you can track the usage of the software or the usage of the data set, and uh, the users can, uh, in turn, be notified if something changes. So that, uh, I think that's, that's a very useful development. Uh, it, how well does um, putting your data on development sites like GitHub help in uh, developing collaborations uh, based on your experience? I mean, it's the only thing I think that works, actually. You, it's the only thing that works? Like, if you're actually looking for, like, international collaborations with yeah. people you don't how, know how personally. Yeah, how do you get your software out? And otherwise, it would be incredibly hard. I mean, you could organize yourself over mailing lists, but to have this kind of... I mean, GitHub is really made for this kind of collaborative code development. Do you think people regularly search GitHub for software no. that they're interested in? No. Don't think so. But if it's on GitHub, people will find the GitHub page, I think. But re realistically, though, um, if you develop useful software, and it, it's usually enough to just announce it on, during your talk or through a, a web serve just once that you're releasing the software and uh, people will talk to you. That's, that is not an issue. <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, no, no. Go, go. Oh, come on. I was just going to say uh, one quick comment on the question of uh, what to do about stuff that's from papers that haven't been published yet. At least personally for me, the stuff I've 
written that's gotten the most usage was actually from papers that never got published. So I would say that most people don't find it through publications in my experience. It's more from GitHub and other things. Uh, that's just my experience anyway. Switch. Uh, but on the other hand, things that actually really get used a lot really should be citable. And I mean, and usually, if there's any novelty in the methodology, the methodology ought to be citable, and so that it really is important to publish also. And then, like in seismology, there are actually papers that, are like journals that do accept kind of software contributions, and we did this quite a bit actually, and yeah, it has helped a lot. So I can like only, if you have a, like a software that's actually some kind of significant effort, and especially if you want to keep maintaining it, I would also recommend definitely writing a paper. I'm sidetracking again. How do you do that though when it's something that the whole point is not to be novel? I mean, when it's just to implement methods that are widely used, but no one's bothered to implement them in whatever language, whatever platform you're using, or they're hidden behind proprietary software. I mean, the thing I'm thinking of is, it's, it's you know, it's a Stereonet program, basically. But it's, it's pretty widely used, but you could never publish that. I mean, even the journals that accept, I, I don't know of journals where you can just say, hey, here's a package that's been used, here's a documentation. I mean, yeah, you can get a DOI, but that is, that's not usually citable. But there are journals, these two, right? and like you mentioned, two papers that actually explicitly are for scientific software. It's one page, one page abstract. You but get will, kind of citation for it. Will editors actually accept a citation of that? Yeah, why not? Fair and any kind of, as long as you have a DOI for something, I mean, I think also like kind of committees would accept that more and more if you have. I hope at least. <laughs> yeah, the, the Journal of Open Source Software, it's a real journal. It has an ISSN, it has the DOI, it'll show up in Google Scholar and everything. So, um, yeah, it's completely citable. Uh, just one point on the Journal of Open Source Software that I think is important to mention. <coughs> review, there is a review process there, and the review is not a conventional yeah. scientific review thinking about impact on a field, it's a code review. It's a review of the integrity of it as software. And they've just started it, but I think there's an interesting sort of bootstrapping process to build credibility for that and value for those kinds of reviews of software itself. So um, maybe, maybe I should add to that, that um, uh, so, a change of everyday practice needs to really happen, a shift needs to happen here, because people haven't really warmed up to the idea of citing a, 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 any development other than a paper. Um, but um, it's, it's happening, and in, in a couple of years, I, I, there should be um, quite a few easy ways to attribute DOIs to software developments and data sets. And um, there is an initiative, well, uh, there is a wider NSF initiative called EarthCube that is um, intended to um, produce um, reproducible workflows um, behind each paper, essentially. So that um, every paper, that there is, um, within EarthCube, there is this um, uh, initiative called the Geoscience Paper of the Future, um, um, where the idea is that um, um, in, in the future, when you, when, when you click the button to pub when, you, when you publish a paper, you click the button to release the workflow that, um, that went into your paper. I mean, how many times have we all, you know, stared at um, low quality plots in publications and tried to compare with our results? Uh, or tried to reverse engineer the data that, that went to the, into those plots. So that, that should not be an issue anymore. Um, all of the digital material that goes into a paper should be accessible, but not only the material, also the workflow that led you to the material, including all of the intermediate software steps. So I think we're going there. We're, I don't, I, we're not there yet, but in a few years we sh should be able to pr produce workflows like that. Well, I think there is a comment. I, I, you know, I just wanted to throw in the AGU hat that there's uh, AGU initiatives to, um, there's a lot of people working on this. It's, we're on the forefront of it and it's going to change. Yeah. Sarah? Is the Journal of Open so Software, has that been around long enough that it has an impact factor? No. I, I think it's at most a year old. Okay, so another year, year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So, on the next slide, um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we, we have the next slide up and been kind of, this is one I think that a lot of people, um, <laughs> have comments about. We have all ones and twos there. 
Um, so, uh, Gary, have, I guess. How about Leo starts first? He's starts <laughs> Leo, you want to take Which it? Leo? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't say wider community as a whole, but I, I can speak from experience from my, at least the, the lab that I was working in. Um, so when I first started doing my master's in Rio, uh, we were each doing our own thing. Um, I was doing my own Python code. Uh, my friends who were under the same supervisor, they were writing their own C or Fortran code, and no one was really sharing anything. And so I, I started building this Python library with everything that I was writing. So basic stuff like just plotting your model or making a, uh, making a mesh or making some random points for a grid. And yeah, I started kind of pushing for that and trying to get my, at least my lab mates to try it out. And what ends up happening is that nowadays, um, my friend who was a grad student there, he's a researcher in the lab and I think every single student in the lab now is using that software as a basis for their thesis and they're writing their own Python code on top of that and publishing it as well um, on GitHub with their papers. So if, you, if you're persistent and you have people surrounding you who are open-minded, because I was very lucky that my advisor didn't shut me down or she really encouraged. Um, so, yeah, if you're lucky enough to have that and you're persistent about it, you can change the culture of a lab within your stay in grad school even. I'd like to second that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, when, uh, I, I guess it, it, it kind of cements in stone a standard operating procedure that may be in a chemistry lab. Like you do this and then you do that and you do that and you're always working against a standard. And so developing that in the software basically puts that in there and you're using that and you know exactly what has happened when somebody has, let's say, cited that software and has used it for all of their theses, right? It, it, makes, it makes life easier. You may can actually build things out of the things that are reusable and it's, it makes doing research actually a lot easier. Um, yeah, I just think I've noticed, um, like my community is Malachi. I mean, it's not like a big community, but it's also not a small yes. one. Yes, Definitely several <laughs> thousand people worldwide. And I guess we first released our code like maybe eight years ago now. And the first three, four years were uh, pretty slow going, went to conferences, yeah, what the hell are you doing? But over time, people started accustomed to start to use it, and now more and more people are actually using it. We have like whole research groups kind of flipping from their existing workflows. Because one thing I think our code does really well, because it's written in Python, so the big thing for it, it actually makes writing complete workflows from all stage, from like data acquisition, processing, I.O., um, process, uh, sorry, plotting, it's all, you can all write this in one single workflow. And as a result of this, many, many people switched. Another thing we've noticed is that kind of like the AppSpy thing we wrote, it serves as a base layer for many other applications. So people just use this and then develop actual proper applications or more specialized tools on this. And that means somebody went through the effort, writes something additional, makes a website, documents it, tests it, pushes it to the community, maybe writes a paper on this. And I mean, we have, I want to say, between 50 and 100 things essentially written on top of AppSpy. So I want to say like the total impact on the community has been fairly large, actually. Um, so I guess I could comment on a few things. I mean, one, um, you know, releasing the modeling codes that I have has enabled, you know, myself and other students and researchers to model data, um, you know, more accurately like are in higher dimensions than they could using, you know, the earlier code. So that's, it's helped advance the science. Um, but also um, in both academia, academia and industry, because I, I, you know, I work, I collaborate with people in both places. Um, the codes, my, my codes have actually been used as a benchmark. Um, against other people's codes. Like for example, um, somebody, um, you know, an academic research group may be developing their own code that does something differently, you know, than my code. And so then in the paper, they'll show the comparisons of, you know, their code versus my code and how accurate it is. Or maybe they're, they're testing, the, you know, comparing the speeds of the code. Um, and, and I've seen the same thing in industry as well. And I think it's, it was particularly valuable to industry to have this open source code um, that they could use for benchmarking simply because, um, like for example, 
you know, I do work with some of the major oil companies and they have contractors and the contractors have their own proprietary codes. And so somebody at a major oil company like uh, Ken, who was here, I think he left now, but he worked at Exxon, you know, he might use my code and try to compare, um, you know, ask the contractors to compare their code to my code just to, ver just to validate that the um, contractor's code is actually giving an accurate result because the oil companies are never going to get to see the contractor's code. They're just going to get to see, you know, the results of how it processes the data. So I think it's really important to have these open source codes out there that are, are available to both you know, industry and academia to, to basically benchmark for, for accuracy and speed. Well, I almost fell off the chair when I heard a seismologist say that he was from a small community. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to some others. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm from the electromagnetic community and that's really small. It's not as small as the very specialized seafloor electromagnetic community, but in, it, it, it's a pretty small community, electro, electromagnetic geophysics and magnetotellurics. And so I think the, the, the uh, I'll, I'll just speak to the, uh, the 3D inversion code that I, I've been involved in in releasing two 3D inversion codes. And I think they've made a, a huge impact on, you know, uh, the community trans, transitioning to starting to work in 3D because it really isn't something that you can, well, you might find a graduate student that you could ask to write a 3D code if, you know, he had a background in computer science and mathematics and, and worked for four years on it. Um, but it's not something that very many people in the community could do without somebody making a code available. Uh, so I think it's, it's had a huge impact on, on uh, you know, I, I get to hear my name a lot in conferences and actually less and less as people just use it and don't even mention mention the, uh, my name, but, or Anna's name too, because Anna was very involved in this also. And Nasser Mechbel, I should mention his name. I mean, the three of us really were heavily involved in that development. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, I think it's made a huge impact, and I think it really has enabled uh, the community to move forward. And I should also say that, you know, that this is sort of like not the first time in this community that something like this happened. I think um, uh, there were codes for 2D inversion that were free, freely released um, about 20 or so years ago, and that really created a, a complete revolution in the field of magnetotellurics. And if they hadn't been made freely available so that everybody could just start learning how to interpret data in two dimensions and now in three dimensions, I, the, the science would have been held back a great deal. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to just add, piggyback on uh, um, Gary's comment. Uh, specifically, his code has really been really useful to the community. Um, it, you know, it wasn't the first 3D code that was out there. Um, in fact, there, was, there were several 3D codes, but they were um, either um, held privately in sort of quasi-academic research groups or the codes were, you know, used by companies, you know, developed within, um, you know, major uh, oil exploration companies and they were not released to the public. So you'd see these papers where people would publish results of their 3D model um, studies, you know, interpreting data, but you could never get access to the code. And as somebody who collects data and wants to model in 3D, it's really frustrating. And then Gary's code comes along and it's just everybody, everybody breathes a sigh of relief because now they can model their data in 3D. Still not easy. And Anna's code. <laughs> yeah, and, and in terms of like, you know, I mean, to go back to a question, uh, one of the earlier questions, just a little bit, there, as Kerry said, there, is, there have been a number of 3D codes that have been developed uh, before these freely released codes. And I think, uh, I think that the freely released codes um, are, are much more used and have had a much bigger impact both on the community and on the people who released them. Other people who kept them for themselves, they have their code, yeah. and I guess that's good. But. I was actually very surprised to hear that it took you five years to publish it, because at our induction workshops that we have every two years, which are, were hundreds, not thousands, yeah. um, uh, it seemed like half of the talks were Anna and Gary's um, code. And it's, you know, it, it was a huge impact on the community. And it happened in 2D, and then it happened in 3D. That's right, right. the same thing happened in 2D. Um, yes, but then I was uh, looking for a job and um, I couldn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> because I wasn't publishing enough. Yes, please. Uh, I, I have a question, is because 
this, I think it's very nice when, when you release a package, like what you've done. It's a very useful software package. But I was thinking now, when you release it, what license do you decide to release it on? Is it GPL, okay. MIT, Apache license? Mm -hmm. So, because you gotta find a trade-off. You might say, well, I don't care what license I use, I just want to release it. But the other part is, I think that people who develop the code and they deserve some amount of credit. And then you wanna guarantee that the work that you did, people don't make it proprietary based on that. So I think that's important. So what license would you recommend people release their code on? Well, I, I did not use any of those licenses for exactly the reasons that you just said. Because, because, because there, there is actually uh, uh, among some very, among, there is some commercial interest in it and uh, I don't see why I shouldn't be able to benefit from that. This kind of kind of brings back the question that was asked a while ago about, uh, well, it was more of a comment where um, there was a piece of code that they couldn't get licensed for in order to use it in the industry, therefore they couldn't use the entire code. Yeah. So it's very important that you choose a license and you pay attention to which license the code that you are uh, either copying or linking to. So it's very important to see what kind of license they use as well because if it's not properly licensed and you want, like, if you don't mind that people in industry use it, they're not going to touch it if there's no license and they're not going to touch it if a part of it will be in a license that will infect their own code base, like the GPL. Um, so then I would say between GPL and a more liberal license like the MIT or BSD Apache, um, the, then the question is how much do you care that uh, industry uses your code? So if you don't want someone to get your code and put it in a commercial software that is closed source, then you would have to go with GPL because they probably wouldn't touch any code that's GPL, but if you don't mind that, then BSD is usually better, because or MIT, because it, it allows for that kind of thing. Um, doesn't restrict it, but it, at least gives you some rights. There's also, oh, sorry, There's also another sort of argument to make for like more free license like BSD or MIT. Like if you want to kind of have a library and integrate with many other libraries or you want to be used by other packages, in one sense you don't enforce a license on them. Because if you use some kind of copy left license, all kind of dependent packages will also depend on that. Which depending on the community might be okay or might not be okay. But it's definitely something you should definitely consider. And there are some packages like the YT package, like an astrophysics volume rendering code. They specifically moved to, I don't know what they had before, but they moved to a BSD license because they wanted to be able to be integrated into other packages without enforcing their kind of they were GPL. And it's also really hard to change the license after the fact once you have a reasonable number of contributors. Yeah. Just yeah. be careful, I guess. Yeah, Our, my, the software package I worked on ran into this problem. And then when we, when we have a, a release, we can't include uh, GPL or LGPL code in our code base because if we did, we would have to release it as a copyleft type of license. And so that goes, it directly conflicts with the current license that we have, which is the specialty license derived by the lawyers between the uh, National Lab and IRIS. So yeah. it's kind of annoying. I also think you can bring this argument with like the public pays for it, the public owns it again. Some are quite strong opponents sometimes of BSD software for many applications, actually. And that's basically also the only thing that made the whole scientific Python ecosystem is all MIT or BSD licensed, which is the only thing why it actually works so well. This would be GPL, it would be orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, uh, for example, in the Python community, almost everything is either BSD or MIT licensed. So a lot of... Um, other projects in the Python community, they won't touch your code if it's GPL. Because right? you can't even, you might not copy any code, but you can't even import code from a GPL library without releasing your own code as GPL. So that's a, a bit of a drawback when you're thinking about that. You're probably going to have less people building on top of your library if it's not all GPL. There's one alternative license, it sits in between both, it's called the MPL, which I think is the Mozilla public license. Essentially a file level uh, copy left license. So they can include it in their own code as long as they do not modify the one file your code sits in. So it's like a nice middle ground. Um, questions or comments? 
If I understand correctly, uh, the copyleft license you talk about is GPL version 3, and GPL 2 is not so restrictive. Yeah. Am yes. I right? Yeah. I th we still have that problem with GPL version 2. So we, I would have preferred a, a BSD license or MIT license for whatever we wanted to include, but we had to find an alternative. So. Just a question about sort of not quite wider community, but other community. Um, do any of you have other contributors to your software? And if so, can you say something about where those contributors came from, how you work with them, um, how that emerged over time? Uh, the, the only other contributor to my software, well, I can't say that there, there's only one other because I think there's probably a host of probably 100 people that have contributed over the past 30 years. Um, but the current contributor is, uh, He's retired and he started in 1992, I think, um, doing the software. Um, and that he, he's, he was a professor at, at one of the institutions in the United States. And so he just continued on and has, has tracked the software over the last however many years that is, 25 years, I guess. I have a somewhat unusual um, collaborator in that he was, he was a former student who now is a consultant and he just works as a consultant, but he's perfectly happy um, adding to you know some of my codes, particularly the graphical user face sides of my codes, um, simply because he's happy that I'm creating the codes and making them open source so that he can then use them on his consulting job. So it's sort of like a little present back to me. He allows his additions to be included in the code base, but he's you know he's his consulting business is is you know profitable enough that he can do that. Um, no biggest code we have like. You know, quite a number of contributors, they come from like different backgrounds. Some of them just use our code and figure out there there's one crucial piece missing. So they add it. And there are also lots of, um, well, not lots, but a reasonable number of like data centers. There's like professional coders. They also need something for their purpose. And now we're slowly getting big enough for, again, also data centers, where the two or three cases, where they actually contract somebody to add code, add, uh, code to our project. So, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I've mostly had like grad students who were interested in using the the code for something, and yeah, sometimes they find a bug, or sometimes they want something that isn't implemented, so they'll give it a shot. Uh, I think the biggest barrier to getting people involved is learning version control. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that is, I guess, it's slowly decreasing because I see more and more people who have at least come across it and they are interested and want to learn. Um, but yeah, getting people through that is a bit difficult and it helps a lot if you state clearly that uh, you will help people who, are, who want to contribute something but they're not very comfortable with the technology. And investing a bit of time and helping those people start, um, it might be a good investment of your time because if you do get an active collaborator, um, then you're gonna get a lot of the time investment back and they might be people who are willing to help other newcomers. So you can kind of scale it up that way. Um, actually, I have one, one question which digs into uh, less of a practical aspect but more of a philosophical aspect, which is um, with the communities that you have around you and users, do you notice that it helps to have something like you know, a manifesto or something that describes, hey, this is open source, this is why we're doing it, we're trying to improve the world or whatever, or do you think that from all your interactions, people are just very practical, they use what's there, they don't really care about, let's say, the larger goal? Because I've seen some projects have you know, pronounced manifestos, you know, we're gonna save the world, and that's why we're doing open source. Um, and, and maybe people come along for the ride because they believe in the mission rather than believing that the code is amazing. Mm. And others just grab stuff from GitHub and work with it and are not really engaged. So I was just wondering if you have any experiences of either side doing something in community um, building. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any kind of code of conduct or something, but maybe we should. Or just have some formal process to <coughs> solve disagreements. I think people for us, they just use it because it's practical. But at one point, if we grow more, we might need some kind of more formal rules and some more, I guess, idealistic guidance in some sense. So. I, mean, I mean, not from my own projects, but I know from other projects that a lot of the developers that get involved in these are, you know, they do have sort of a manifesto in mind. Like, they want to change the world through making, you know, open source code. It's kind of like, 
you know, screw the man kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I think that that's probably more common amongst people who are contributing to the project through helping to you know, develop the code rather than the users. I would think that that's more common in things like um, internet browsers or security libraries and stuff like that. But uh, on the science part, I think it's probably mostly people who found it useful and they want to make it better and help out. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's really, I mean, most of the people are, motiv are motivated by personal interest or in some sense, uh, you know, interest in, in being able to accomplish do the science that they want to do, and uh, I mean, they don't think they're going to save the world by, by you know, improving some software. I think they want to save the world by doing something practical, by saving the world. Maybe we could share. Yeah, 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 we can share. Yeah. 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 Is it down? Yeah. No, it's, it's So, question. Yeah. Um, what do you do when somebody doesn't cite your code in, like, say, like a paper that's widely read or like in a high impact journal? Or something? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Just accept it. Just let it go. It's the same thing you do when somebody doesn't cite your paper. You complain to them. Well, if, you're, if, if, you, if, you, if you get to review their paper, you can, <laughs> you can get even a little bit. Uh, a part of that is um, uh, the citation information for your software should be very visible and very clear. So um, if you have a project web page or even the readme file, there should be a clear section there saying, like, please cite my code and the citation is this. This is the DOI. If you can, give them a BibTeX uh, code that they can copy and paste on their LaTeX file. So make it as easy as possible and make it known that you want your software to be cited. And I think most people will cite it. Yeah, I think one thing to add too is that you know a lot of times people might not cite your software and it's simply unintentional. Like maybe a, an advisor gave your code to their student and the student you know didn't read your paper and doesn't know you know what the the, the yeah. distribution terms were and things like that. So um, you know, polite reminder is probably the, the recommended approach. I'd like to add. I, I wrote a piece of software for a, a geochemistry group and at the end of the readme it says every time you run this you owe me a beer. I have yet to get a beer. <laughs> I just wanted to, to add a comment to what he was saying. I think it's in line what he was saying. Usually when people use some kind of open source code, they just want to get something. Well. Come a little closer. Maybe you can lift it. Just yeah. Get over to you. Yeah. So I, I was saying that usually when, when people use open source code, they want to get something done because they have an objective in mind. You, may, you might be a graduate student, so you, you need to get results. <clears throat> So if somebody finds a piece of code that is open source, they can use it. The main reason why at the end of the road, they will basically might contribute their own source code that they develop on top of that, is not because of any manifesto. It's out of gratefulness. Yeah. For example, if I download your source code and you completely openly just share it and you don't put limitations and all that, when I develop a code, I think, well, the least that I could do is just to share it with other people so that they can benefit too because I benefit from, from it. So I don't think a manifesto, in my view, would make any, any difference. So as long as people make the, the, their source code open and people can use it, the only reason why people would, at the end of the road, contribute their own code and their own contributions is out of gratefulness and maybe a sense of like they owe that to somebody else that might come after them and they don't want them to go through all the hassle and all yeah. the hell that it takes to write a piece of code like for 3D interpretation and things like that. I think that's the only factor that would matter at the end. The manifesto will not make much of a difference. <laughs> in my view. I feel like some people are also like kind of ashamed to share their code. Like if they're not experienced coders and they obviously hack something together, it's extremely long, extremely tedious to like read and write. I think um, yeah, I, I can encourage anyone to just share your code. I mean, that's what you use for your research. It's, it's honest. If, if it sucks, it sucks. But just get it out there. Maybe somebody else learns something from it. Yeah. And also, like, just kind of on that note, maybe a bit, um, we have lots of people that are kind of hesitant to contribute to our code. Because when they send a pull request, we like, have certain expectations on the code quality of the thing. And they kind of get like, I don't know. They don't like this being openly criticized or being openly told to change something. And I'm not entirely sure how to solve this. I mean, 
Yeah. So, so how, how do you control the quality of the input? I mean, do you, do you take you, the effort to screen and look at the code? Of course. And, I mean, yeah. essentially any time you so accept... So there's a gatekeeper. But they have there to has be. to be, of course. Like any time you accept it, you own it. So you have to be able to... You essentially commit to maintaining it for the near future, not the long future. I, I know we're getting off of any of the topics that were, that were intended to be discussed here, but I mean, it seems to me that that's, one of, that that's one of the real challenges to open source software is that there's really... You know, it, it requires somebody like you who really wants to do this. <laughs> and also who has, who, who has you know... Uh, a skill, a, sp a very specific no, skill. I, I, I think it's also a changing mentality as well. Um, so I co-taught this research computing graduate level class with an oceanographer who's a very um, prolific Python open source coder. And um, so one of the requirements we had of the grad students is they had to do this final project, coding project, and they had to upload it to GitHub and make it a public repository. In fact, every assignment had to be uploaded to GitHub, but they could be private for the assignments, but the, the final project had to be public. And the idea was to just get grad students used to just putting their codes on GitHub. They're available. Other people, you know, they can share them with people. It's real easy. People can make pull requests, you know, if they modify the codes, things like that. So it's trying to change sort of the, the mindset of, of people. Yeah, I want to come back to what I was saying, because I think it's completely different from what you just brought up, which is that somebody has to put a lot of effort in. Somebody, there has to be a responsible party at the center of the code who has to put a lot of effort in. And unless there's, unless there's a source of, of uh, reward, <laughs> Um, and and, and that, that, that has to be somewhat monetary. In other words, you have to, be, you have, to have a job which will allow you to do this. Uh, or or, or, or it, it's really hard to go down that road. Yeah, I think like modern kind of and development environments make this a bit easier. So you can have like minimal requirements. The code has to like be formally correct. It has to be, uh, it has to be fully tested. It has to have certain kind of standards that make it easier to enforce certain kind of, at least the minimum requirements before you accept something. Yeah. Uh, with regards to publishing your own code, um, like something you wrote for a paper, I would say that uh, ugly code is infinitely more usable than no code at all. And so no, if it's useful to someone, no one's gonna complain to you that it's ugly, right? Because they'll be so happy that they didn't have to write it themselves. Um, and with regard to handling contributions, I think that one thing that helps, or maybe, a, I don't know if it will really help, but at least it formalizes this, is having a clear uh, guide for people who want to contribute. It doesn't have to be super extensive, but it could just say, okay, when you submit your code, um, we are gonna review it and say explicitly that we are gonna try to be very constructive. Uh, we're not criticizing you as a person. We're not saying that you're a bad developer. We're just trying to make sure that the code fits our pattern and that it'll, it'll be useful for everyone else uh, and is correct. And getting something like a code of conduct for your project, as soon as it starts getting one or two contributions, it's a good way of establishing the, um, the general rules of the community. So basically just saying that, okay, no one is allowed to be rude to you and people have to be civil, no personal attacks, and there will be consequences for this. So just knowing that might make someone who is a little bit hesitant to share their or make a contribution, it might ease them. And on that note, also be, try to be very clear on what kind of contributions you want. Like especially if the code grows, there may, might be things you just might not want. So somebody might spend weeks and try to get something ready, and then just have to say no. So it's better to be upfront, but be polite. But you have any, every project has a certain scope. Yeah. And you need to be clear about that, and you maybe don't want to move behind that. Just a pointer that might be of interest, um, and full disclosure, I run a grants program at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and I fund a lot of work in this area. Um, one of the projects that's come out of a, a grant to the Mozilla Foundation, Mozilla runs a group called the Mozilla Science Lab, yeah. and one of the things that's come out of that um, that they haven't really done a good job of publicizing yet is a, a curriculum kind of on the model of the couple day software carpentry boot camps um, that's really about tr teaching scientists how to run open source projects. And so there's a curriculum called Working Open. If you just do a search for Working Open Mozilla Science Lab, you'll see it's gone through a couple iterations and it, they, they're doing pilot kind of workshops now, but the core curriculum are things like version control, how to write a code of conduct, what your contributor structure looks like, a lot of those things. And I really would just underscore the point that, you know, 
the technology can help lower the cost, but this doesn't all come for free. And, and you know, one of the things we really do need to do is figure out how to make sure the work of, 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 of project maintenance and documentation and a lot of the other things that are necessarily is valued enough to, to be credible contributions, particularly if there's disproportionate impact and, and value to, to science for well-written software. Uh, just to add on the code of conduct thing, um, you don't have to write one yourself. You can just Google code, uh, what was it, contributor covenant, and they have a template code of conduct that you can just put in your contact information and paste that on your project. And um, so you don't need to, it, like, you can do it in five minutes. Yeah. And also, we talk about things like setting up testing infrastructure and documentation and kind of a good code structure. For most programming languages, there are like existing so kind of cookie cut, uh, cookie templates out there, you can just use them, and they give you a very good initial structure to get started. Yep. Okay, we have the next question. Oh. <laughs> Has your perception of open source software changed as a result of your experiences? And we have... No. <laughs> no, I, why not? I, I remember when the Cathedral and the Bazaar came out back in, I don't know, some number of decades ago. And uh, if you don't know what that is, go ahead and look it up. Um, uh, and it, it made a big difference. I was an undergraduate when I read it. And uh, it, was, it was kind of this interesting document. And, and it was about the time, I guess, the internet was in the World Wide Web was coming along. And I kind of got into this, this computing community at that time. And, it kind of got ingrained in me. And so I guess that's my only world that I've been knowledgeable of. So I, I did put a six there, but uh, with regard to have you adopted new practices, uh, I would say that the biggest impact on how I do research has not been any class or any textbook. It was discovering the Software Carpentry website and taking their, at the time they had this self-assessment quiz, and if you scored negatively on that, it meant that you pretty much didn't even know about the existence of all these tools they were saying, and I, yeah, I got a pretty big negative score. Um, so that opened up all these doors, um, and knowing about version control and automated testing and what you can do with it, um, that has had a huge impact on everything I do from writing the abstract for this conference to uh, doing the open source work or writing a paper. So learning version control uh, is so helpful. I can't imagine doing anything without having the security of thinking that if I screw up, I can just go back to the previous iteration. No problem. So it's, uh, it has changed the practices and I have learned these new things and they are helpful outside of open source. They, they will help. Uh, your career as a whole. Um, I've, I've had more experience than he has, so I've had. So I definitely have. have, have uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I would say that I, uh, you know, the structure of, of a lot of programs that I wrote is not conducive to open source, and in fact, programs that I, you know, that 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 has been used that is heavily used. It, it's it's a uh, it's a program that I wrote you know in Fortran 77 or maybe it was Fortran 66 um, that you know uh, uh, is is he it's quite heavily used it's still quite heavily used for processing data um, and uh, no way it's just completely the way that it the structure you know it's in 60 files and uh, it's it's absolutely <laughs> Absolutely not something that uh, um, somebody, could, other people could contribute to and modify. Um, so I, I've learned that that doesn't work. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think I still, you know, I'm not really a, an open source software coder. I think that's a, I think you really have to sort of design the software from the start in a way that other people can contribute. And you know, some languages are a lot better for that than others. And you know, I mean, Fortran is probably, and C are probably not that well suited to a, a lot of people. And it also depends upon the project. 
And so that's one of the things that I'm realizing even now, I've learned something now, listening to some of these discussions of having multiple contributors, thinking how hard it would be, you know, to, you know, let somebody go in and change something inside of some, some routine that, that would affect a lot of things. And it would be, you know, I mean, ha being able to, you know, the structure of the code isn't, isn't such that you could easily test these, all of these additions. So you have to have some, uh, you, you have to start from, uh, start at the beginning with the idea that it's open source probably, to, to really m have it be an effective open source code. Yeah, but I guess I'd add on the testing front, um, that's one of the things that um, I didn't realize when I was making my code freely available, and that was that, you know, I tried to make it as robust as possible, and it was developed with a certain set of assumptions for how people would use it. And then, of course, people go and use it using a, their own set of assumptions, and they email you when the results aren't quite uh, as nice as, as they think they should be. And, um, and so you learn, you learn a lot about how to make your codes uh, more robust for um, different users and, and how to expand them to handle different sorts of scenarios or assumptions that people may have when they're using them. So you can, you know, ultimately, it leads, I think it leads to a better piece of software because you have more eyes on the code. You know, or, or its applications. Yeah. Um, I just want to quickly comment on the last question, like how it's changed your perception of other software. So like working on like any kind of software made me realize how enormously complex the complete stack of all libraries is we actually work with. So even if you do some, whatever, MATLAB, Python, anything you use, it builds on some libraries, they build on some other libraries, and those are basically probably some millions of kinds of code, millions of, ki millions of lines of code you use every day. And the kind of complete complexity of this would be impossible for any one person or any one group or any one university to handle. So it's really a, it's kind of a nice thing. It's like a big worldwide effort that enables many of the things we do these days. I maybe have one question of, where, of a more personal nature, which is if any of this in your uh, experience affected your perception of the science you're doing and whether, for instance, it gave you a feeling that you're doing better science or you're being more responsible, and all the things relating to traceability, reproducibility, if at a personal level you just feel better about huh. your work, or has that not really you know, come into your perception of? Yeah. I personally feel a lot faster. So many things, because I'm quite a fairly capable coder, I can do many things fairly fast. And because of sometimes I test my you, paper code, it's the same thing. Happier? Can... Yeah, happier? I guess I'm not from because a... you released code in open source. Uh, Maybe. I, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's what you're getting at, right? I mean, are, you, are, are we happy that we released the codes or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I just meant just from, a, from a more abstract sense, like, yeah. do you feel you're doing better science? Do you leave yeah. at the end of the day feeling, you know what, I did a good thing in the world because yeah. I'm doing better science than when my code was not being released or I was not contributing to open source? Like, yeah. is it very, very practical only, or is there some sort of other layer to it that your job satisfaction even or your role as a scientist is in some sense fulfilled better by doing open source? If that's that's a very deep uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> I, one thing I can add, like I'm more careful when I put code out, out there. Yeah. Like I'm a bit more careful what's in it and try to make sure it's correct. Yeah. But the deeper philosophical aspect I'd have to think a bit about. <laughs> so um, I would say the, this Python library that I was developing, um, the forward modeling that's on there was the basis for my thesis and a lot of the students in that, uh, my research group, they're using that. Uh, so I, I try to put a lot of effort into writing comprehensive tests for that code, um, which was a way of, for me to learn how to do this kind of testing. And that really paid off because uh, I found some bugs in the, the mathematical formula, right? So um, for example, uh, I had never calculated the gravitational field beneath the prism. But then when someone asked me if it would be possible, I decided to test it, wrote a test for that, didn't work, found out that the arctangent function was returning, doing something weird, uh, fixed that. Turns out that a master's student um, in Australia later wanted to use that code, and he started benchmarking it against a commercial implementation, and he actually found a bug in the commercial code. Uh, so it, yeah, it does make you feel well that okay, uh, I put a lot of effort into this, I put a lot of effort into making the tests, and it does make better science because I can be confident in my results. Um, and I can be confident that if 
some graduate student then in the lab is running something and he gets a wrong result, it's probably not the forward modeling. So don't even look at that code, check something else. And so it, it also makes it faster because you don't have to go back and look at the code every single time to make sure that when you copy and paste it, you didn't rename a variable or you forgot a global variable and then you redefine it and now the constant is off by a factor of 10 and you didn't realize. I mean, another um, thing to add to this, which is sort of related is, you know, like I know if I'm asked to write a letter of recommendation for somebody and they're releasing open source software, it's something I've mentioned in the letter. I say this person is having an impact on the community because they are releasing their open source software and then presumably, you know, if they get a, an advancement or a new position from that, then that, you know, that obviously is helping their career, so. Uh, I'd like to, to, I don't know, is it double or triple the testing side. It's, it's really, really important, especially when you're releasing code, to, to prove to yourself that what you've done is, is what you think you were expecting it to happen. So that's, it's, that's a really important. And on the happiness side, um, I guess I get a little dose of happiness when I walk around the, the AGU here and I look at the posters and I say, oh look, that, made, that was made with my piece of software. Or, you know, I, I saw in the New York Times, hey, New, uh, test ban tree, or the New York, uh, the North Korean event. Oh, that plot looks familiar. And so, you know, it's like, hey, great. Anyone else in the audience? Who, who in the audience uh, develops open source software, or has released open source software? Yeah, so pretty good chair. So I've got a, a half comment, half question relating to that. One thing I'll say is, uh, I don't know if this is true for anyone else, that's the question part, but at least for me, when I started developing particularly open source stuff, I kind of cut my teeth initially on open source code bases, contributed a lot to Matplotlib early on and thought, oh man, this is, this is a really rough code base in some places. And uh, you get this fear that, you know, your code is bad, you start to really focus on it, and then I wound up in industry. And my perception of open source didn't, well, it changed in the sense that I realized that code was really good. Closed source code has a lot more, um, doesn't get as many eyes on it. Uh, the, the proprietary code bases I've worked with have been a lot less nice than open code bases. So one thing I, I guess I would ask if anyone else had the same experience is that opening code forces you to write it in a way that's readable. And proprietary code, even when it's internal stuff that a lot of people are working on, is quite often written in a very, very confusing way uh, and a, honestly very poor practices. And that's less common for open source projects. Yeah, just to say, I, I completely agree. Uh, and just because it's commercial doesn't mean it's correct. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, moving forward. Do you regret your decision to make your software openly available? And if so, why? I guess that's so, me, Brian, right? you say <laughs> you're up first, yeah. Uh, I guess, I, again, the history of this code is that I, I wasn't involved in, in the decision to make it open source, um, or at least to make it open. Um, I would have preferred that the lawyers had gotten themselves out of it, and we could have just changed it to a BSD license or, or a typical open source license. That would have made my life a lot easier, and we would have probably had a, a, a better contribution to the... Uh, um, to, to the seismological community. And I think OpsPy, I think, as we learned today, or like I learned, may have been a slightly bit different, but probably exactly the same in terms of its capabilities. Um, uh, I would suggest that anybody that is considering opening their software be, think about it really hard, but just do it. Um, it doesn't, I think somebody has said, it doesn't matter what really what shape it's in, just get it out there and somebody might find it and find it incredibly useful and start con contributing to it. Um, and making it better, and maybe making it better for you as well, so things can get, come back to you as well. Uh, one quick thing to ask, like a note of caution, you might have to ask the legal department of a university or your boss if you're actually allowed to do this. <laughs> like, yeah, you learned this by experience. <laughs> by default, you're not allowed to do this actually, you have to ask. I, mean, I guess I just add, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but um, you know, I don't regret my decision to make my software open source, but it does, um, it can generate a lot of email um, inquiries, especially when you're a single uh, developer and, you know, 
there's people, I, I get emails from people all over the world asking the same question, like how do I do this, how do I do that? And, you know, so you have to think about things like how do you set up maybe a forum or something or some sort of online discussion place so that you're not ha having to field questions on your own um, over email. Yeah, with it, even if it's not super widely used, you will get a lot of email for many years to come. And that's when I think maybe investing your time in trying to recruit more people to help out with the code and putting in the effort to train someone else uh, in the development practices of the code and familiarizing them. Uh, one thing you will gain out of that is that there's someone else who can reply to the emails. So it, it won't all write on you to write the source code and do the testing and publish it and then also have to answer all the emails. So if you can get some help, it always helps. I actually have a question that you, um, we were talking about earlier. Um, could you each say how many people are in your groups? I mean, are you a one or two, or are you a ten, or how? How when you what? How big do you consider your um, community that you're working within, that you're actually interacting with? Um, I, I think most of the development of the software that I, I've been involved in has been done by people who work with me or who are visitors. Um, and there's really, I mean, I, I know that there are some, some people outside of my immediate contact but, uh, who have made modifications, but they've never, I would say that they haven't contributed them back <laughs> to other people. In They're fact. not within your immediate group, right? Yeah, so within the immediate group, it's been, it's, it's you know, probably that have contributed to individual projects. It's from two to five, probably. Leo? Yeah. Um, I mostly had small contributions. Um, so for my, the Python library that uh, I'm doing, the Fatian do Terra library, um, I've had um, a couple of people who got interested and contributed some things, and, but I would say still most of the code there is made by me, and, but yeah, we, I had a few what, what I call like drive-by contributions where someone will just go in, find something wrong, fix it, and then you'll never hear from them again. Uh, so around there, I would, I would guess about 10 to 12 people have contributed something like that. Uh, I would say I am the, the only active developer on the piece of software that I run, um, but there is somebody that actually works on the documentation, which is just awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's really important. Uh, but the, over the, the lifetime of the code, again, I, I can't, I have no idea how many people have worked on the code, but I run across people like at this meeting and it's like, oh yeah, I remember working on that back in the early 90s or something like that. So maybe 30 to 100, depending on. Over like? Over 35 30 years. years. Okay, yeah. um, so I think with OpsPy, we started out as, uh, I want to say, four people, and we've been more or less the same department for two years. And then two of these, well, two of the guys dropped out dropped out of academia. And since then it has been me and another guy, and I want to say maybe at any point of time there may be five to six other people who check in multiple times a week, I want to say. So we have an active contribution base for maybe say six, seven people that do this over, that invest some time. And then we have maybe 20, 30, 40 contributors per year that either do longer term or just again these drive by contributions. And all in all, I think we have like 70 people who directly contribute code during the last couple of years, besides the code. Yeah, mine is mostly me and a former grad student. Um, occasionally, one of my current students will contribute something. But, um, you know, I've, I've been hearing other people here, um, and then also some friends I have and other colleagues that are in other fields of research that are doing much larger um, open source projects where there are multiple people, like five to 50 kind of thing. I, you know, I definitely feel like, um, I feel like I'm kind of missing out. You know, like I'm in my own little lonely world, and it would be nice to be part of a bigger team and have that work within the academic um, sort of system where you know, our currency is, is how many papers have you published. So trying to balance working with a large team to do something useful and also getting unique enough research to publish it, I think, is, is maybe one of the challenges. Anna, you answer. Um, uh, um, yeah, well, I'm, I don't, I develop code mostly by myself and with um, Gary and a few other contributors, but um, I just wanted to, to speak on behalf of Lindsay Higgy, 
our uh, Kokan Vinik, who unfortunately wasn't able to come um, today. Um, so she uh, is an active developer of, of a code called Simpeg in Python, and uh, she manages a very large um, developer base. Um, so there, there are, I believe, um, perhaps, perhaps even a hundred com contributors, hundred plus. Um, and uh, sh they wouldn't be able to do it without the use of those um, multiple convenient um, modern tools that I, I think are underutilized in, in the geosciences, at least in the geophysics community. Um, that, that, that obviously, uh, GitHub, then there, is, there is Slack for, for communication between users and developers so that you don't have to sit there and uh, answer all the questions uh, by email and then answer the same, the same question um, again. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to speak in detail to those um, uh, tools, but perhaps somebody in the audience could um, suggest which, which, which tools um, do, do, do you use yourself um, if you have a large community who contributes to your code? What, what, what do you do? How would you address that? Anyone? Or do you all just develop your own code? <laughs> um, I'm a PhD student and... Uh, Can you I, hold the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. So... Just pull that. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Sweden and my course supervisor is in France. So uh, for the first few years, we, I had a difficult time communicating, communicating with him by email. So now, although we have a small user uh, developer base, we now have switched to a uh, chat room like Slack, or uh, what we use is Riot, which is more open source, uh, makes sense. So now we get active like dialogue, and uh, things are getting solved even faster now. I just want to add to want to encourage anyone, if you have a chance to work on a code, on a code within some kind of group, just go for it, because it's really great fun. And that's very motivating when you have something that's kind of, you know, a collaborative baby and you kind of treat it well. And when you have major milestones, you go have a beer and celebrate it. It's, I don't know, I really enjoy this way of working. And especially scientists, and a lot of times we're just on our own and we kind of sit in our computer and do something. But it's more, it's more fun in a group. And it's an easy way to, yeah, to do things in a group. I, want to, yeah. I guess that's what I want to say. Yeah, uh, with regard to the tools question, um, I would say if you want to do anything with more than that, with at least one other person, um, then you really do want to use version control. And it doesn't matter if it's Git or Mercur Mercurial or Subversion or whatever. Any form of version control will greatly help you when you're trying to collaborate with anyone. Because uh, emailing code back and forth does not scale. <laughs> and also unit tests. Without unit tests, it doesn't scale yeah. either. Shall we switch? Anyone else? Okay. <coughs> what does the future? Okay, we have a two. That's our high score there. Oh, okay. Um. And that goes to. <laughs> Leon. Leon. Um, what do you want to say here? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so one of the things which I think will happen in the future in like, terms of scientific software that in some extent it will get a lot more professional, I guess, because like the, uh, the kind of knowledge, how to do these things, the kind of training, how to do proper development practices, I think will increase. And also like modern platforms like GitHub, this continuous integration services, the documentation generations. These things make it pretty easy, I want to say, if you know how to do it, to do a semi-professional developed software package also just on your own in like a couple of hours. So I think these kind of things will make software more stable, will make the whole development procedure, well, I guess, more professional. And as a result, our software will be able to get more complex, to get bigger, and just more correct. Um, yeah. And in the vein of this, you will also have more contributions, I think. Because if you put it out, it looks, I mean, it's in a good state, people are more likely to contribute. Yeah. It's one of the things. Um, another thing I often wonder, how do you make, like if you have very complex software, I mean, OpsPy conceptually is pretty simple. It's lots of different modules all kind of work together, but it's not like one big cohesive code, like your kind of um, inversion and modeling codes. 
if you have a very complex piece of software, like and only very few people worldwide kind of understand the code, how would you like yeah. continue developing this? It's, to me, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's actually a good point because I think that's there. There is a need for some of those things, and and they're they need to be. I mean, like I think in the in the geoscience community, there's a, a CIG initiative, computational infrastructure yeah. for geodynamics, which which I think. You know, I mean, I think that the source code is is freely available, but I, that isn't really the model. It's not really a community of of co-developers. It's a, it's there's professional programmers developing, you know, highly parallel, you know, codes that could be used on supercomputers, and people do take the codes and make little mod tweaks to them. They become their version of the code, but they're not uh, those kind of codes. I don't know quite how they work in an open source framework. I, I guess another another uh, thought about you know since it said the future I mean I mean um, I think one f future is that a lot more things are just going to be done as web apps. <laughs> People aren't going to have the software. I mean they're they're going to have I mean for these things that 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 are maybe common commonly done things. People are going to go on the web and maybe do them without done. actually having the software themselves. Yeah. I mean. If you Go far future. There's like this thing called WebAssembly, which is basically an assembly language for the web, which will very soon, I think, enable all kinds of codes to be runnable in the browser or some kind of universal operating yeah, system. And, the, and you're going to need professionals to develop that. Not really. At some level. Well, at some of, so okay. To develop the assembly language. <laughs> yeah, well, it does exist. Like all major browsers right, don't have right. it. Just compile it down to WebAssembly. That's yeah. one of these. Uh, I guess I'd like to say that the the reproducibility of results will be should be better if we have better software. Um, it's, that's I guess one of the really important points about science is actually to be able to reproduce somebody else's work because um, if you can't, then we've got a big problem. Um, and I guess the la the other point would be that at least in in my field and and Leon's field that the the use of three-dimensional models and to be able to to use somebody three three-dimensional model and interrogate it and and to, to perform your, anal your analysis within that scope um, should become easier as, the, of course, the, the computational ability goes bigger. And then we should have the tools to be able to do those things in a simplistic fashion. And they should be easier to use as well. But I guess I'd like to add, um, you know, the future is, you know, you guys that are out there in the sense that, um, you know, I, I sort of look at, and people that are in, you know, undergrads now and high school students and elementary school, school students who are, you know, potentially learning a lot more um, high level programming, you know, in, in grade school and high school than maybe what we, what we learned. I mean, I certainly know that I've been doing computational, you know, creating computational software for geosciences for, I don't know, like, 19 years now or something and I still feel like there's so much stuff that I have left to learn and then you know my stepson who you know he's in college now but when he was in high school he was taking Python classes and all these other things and I thought wow wouldn't that have been awesome if I did that when I was in high school you know, so hopefully when he gets to my age he'll be much more advanced than what I am uh, I, yeah. I think that uh, this future <laughs> that we're talking about, it's, uh, I think it's very likely given the huge success that things like software carpentry have had so they, if you don't know what they are, they are a nonprofit and they make, uh, they teach workshops for basic computing skills. So they teach Python, they, te they teach version control. Uh, so this kind of basic stuff that most software developers know but that we don't learn in the sciences. And, but it, it'll still take some effort because learning how to code is not the same as learning how to build software. So being able to program doesn't make you automatically someone who knows how to manage the project, how to set up continuous integration, uh, how to work with these frameworks, how to keep up to date. That's all a lot of things that you need to learn in order to do something like OBSPY that has a lot of contributors and it can't really function if you're just sitting on your own and writing a single C file or Python file. Um, so a, a lot of uh, training needs to, uh, we need to invest a lot in training people uh, to, in, in those kinds of skills uh, for this to be widely adopted. And I, I think that's very likely to, likely to happen. So um, I guess I have something to add. Um, 
I'm part of this um, NSF rescue program, um, and I'm on the leadership council. So I th uh, this is an effort to build cyber infrastructure for the geosciences. And if we succeed, then um, I think the, there is a vision that um, software uh, as well as data sets should be at, at your fingertips if you're reading a paper. If uh, Suppose you, you, know, you obtain new data and you want to reprocess uh, the data set um, to um, see how that new data set changes the result in, in, uh, that's already been published. Or, or you, you have a slightly different method and you want to try it out um, by changing somebody else's software. That, that, um, uh, those components should be a, a part of a workflow that's, that should be accessible from, from a workbench and uh, you should be able to um, bring it into your own workbench and do things with it. Um, there is also some, the, this concept which is called modeling as a service um, which allows, potentially allows users to run um, complex um, software, com complex numerical models remotely on remote servers without bringing in all of the software locally uh, as well as large data sets which that could be involved. Um, so I think there is a lot of cyber infrastructure development um, and computer science that is um, currently cutting edge, but I think it's slowly um, becoming practice in, in, ge in the geosciences also. So I, I think we, 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 we live in, a different, in, in an interesting, um, interesting age. And uh, if, we, if we can overcome this barrier and make both software and da data more easily accessible and easily available, and uh, the work that we put in easily reproducible, then I think we can um, quickly move on to a next level of interpretation. Okay. Anyone out there? All, all of this costs money, yes. a lot yes. of money. Yes. And in an era where um, science funding is not growing and doesn't look like it's likely to. Um, there's there's going to be um, a lot of legitimate resistance from the science community about putting resources into tools completely and not putting resources also into um, actual science. Um, and it, you know that. Well, I would strongly argue that the tools are an essential part of the science. Oh, they, they, so. they are, they are, but, the, but it's not, but we, we have a, we do have this kind of finite sum of yeah. money to spend and, you know, I mean, that, you know, I mean, this certainly has, has happened with things like, you know, in, in, in the ocean sciences where a lot of money got spent on, you know, OOI, this ocean observing initiative and stuff like that. That's a big, a lot of investment in a tool um, to the point where there's no money for people to use the tool. Yeah. Some things, I, some can I'd like to say a lot of money was spent on uh, EarthScope, and we got a lot out of that one. So Th that's right. Sometimes, sometimes the investment pays off, but there is a balance somehow. And and you know, I mean, it, it, the 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 dream of, of of you know, okay, you read a paper, and well, you can just pick up your cell phone and and reproduce all of the results there. Uh, it's going to take a lot. Well, a lot of investment to make that happen. And, but if it was you know, that we're, easy, we're, it's probably you know, not I mean, if, if there were sort of like a real market for it, like for, for, for video games or something, it might be different. <laughs> but I don't think this particular example is that unreasonable. If you have like some kind of synthetic, simple, like, like cheap synthetic examples, you can easily build like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, somewhere. Yeah, right. For, si for simple, they're for, they're for many things. It's for like non-computation expensive things. Right, right. I want to but say. But many, of, many of the things that are exciting that are being published are computation. That is very true. That's expensive. a very different issue. And, and there is no, and, and as the computers get bigger, we're, we're always going to use them at their limit. Of course. I mean, That's we a very different issue. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, like we want to model the geodynamo uh, sure. and you can't even imagine that we'll ever get to the regime unless somebody has a very clever idea about about actual numerical methods that hasn't happened yet. So the science is always going to be using things that are at the limit. So we would like to kind of leave you with a positive thought on, um, you know, what actions can we take now? 
and uh, you know, the obvious one that's up there. Um, but what are some other things? And um, we had about half the hands come up that you are developers, and I'm assuming the other half of the audience are users. Or aspiring developers. Well, yeah, okay. <clears throat> So aside from citations. And so when I, when I got my faculty position at, at the institution I'm at, I asked for release um, for working on the code. So it's part of my external service requirement. And they just assumed it's like the editorship of a journal. Mm -hmm. And so when I do my planning, I have my classes and my research, and then there's this line of software development. And they seem to be OK with that, at least at the college and the department level. And it seemed to work for me. Uh, I think an another thing you can do is, uh, besides citing the software, is um, if you are writing a paper uh, or you're starting a new research project now and you're going to write some code about it, uh, f uh, for it, then try to have it in mind that you might want to publish that code when you're writing it. So. Uh, that will be, it'll be less tempting to just call a variable A and then I and then X. Um, so you will pay more attention to what you're doing if you have it in your mind that, okay, someone else is gonna see this. This is not just gonna sit on my hard drive. Uh, and then when, you're, when it's time to submit the paper, submit the code as well. Um, it's, you can do it, it's not, um, if you started it out uh, with that in mind, you're not going to have to go back and clean it and make it pretty because you will ha already have written it clean and pretty and you can just publish it then. Yeah. Comments? Oh, are we out of comments? No, no more I thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Too late in the, in the afternoon. Like I said, it's to add, I mean, about submitting your code to the journal, um, the, the journal uh, Geophysics, which tends to be an industry um, ge uh, industry journal, for an, uh, um, they have a, um, a software and algorithm section where you can submit your code and they'll actually host it for you or at least host a, a zip file of, you know, snapshot of your code. Universities will actually do the same for you. So you, most libraries have some, have some way of um, hosting your code. You get a DOI with it as well if you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I submitted a code once to geophysics, and um, it wasn't meant to be like a widely used code, but I just wanted to have the snapshot of the code that I used for this research project available. And um, a student um, got a hold of that code and then decided they were going to write a Python version of it. And, and you know, they, they ended up emailing me in a lot, and then we got into the speed test of whose code was faster and stuff. And then he ended up making this breakthrough in the, in the actual algorithm, and it was because I had put this code online, and he could get it. And, tested in MATLAB and then decide he wanted to beat it in Python. So, you know, it was, it was a good outcome and not planned. And um, um, publishing your software with, with, a, with your paper is uh, becoming obligatory in, in some journals and uh, by some institutions, just so that you know, it's, it's, it's becoming common, common practice now. Um, we, uh, I'm with the government um, at the USGS. We are now required to do that. We cannot publish a code um, if we, or rather, we cannot publish our our method without publishing the software that goes with it. Yes, it should be. Yes, it should be. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to our last weave <laughs> to end the thought or to end the panel discussion? We're just going to leave you with these thoughts. And uh, we want to read it. <laughs> I think everybody's can read now. Did you so, read no, she did. Uh, yeah, I edited a little bit, but um, we both had that same feeling um, that, yeah, the future and the future of science is really dependent on communication and open source. Um, this is the first time we've done this. Um, show of hands, do you think we should continue working on this and developing this 
change this conversation uh, going? Do you mean about open source software or this format for AGU? Well, oh. okay, that's two questions there, yes. Um, you probably noticed that there was a lot of experiments going on with the meeting this year, trying new things. Um, some worked, some didn't work. I'm sure they're going to be reviewing it in incredible detail. Um, just show of hands, think this was a good thing? Okay, well you're here, so I guess that's a bias. All the people that <laughs> bias sample. I should but, have asked uh, in the beginning of the panel as well. <laughs> I think some people left. Well, it is they might have had way past zero o'clock, yeah. yeah. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> and the other part of the panel discussion, the audience. Thank you so much for coming. And um, look forward to seeing y'all in DC next year where we'll continue this and maybe a new format or something else. If you have some ideas, some. Um, Send us. Yeah. You want to get yeah. involved or so, um, contact Anna or me, and yeah, um, please. yeah we'll, we'll respond to your emails. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. We're done. Thank you. Thank you.